your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. This is the Atheist Manifesto. From Answer Media, this is the Gay Theist Manifesto. I am your host, Callie Wright, flying solo this week because Ari's schedule is dumb. Kind of like they are. Ooh, burn. Still got to open the show with a joke because that's how we roll. Anyways, this week we're going to have a very interesting conversation. It's a sort of diversion from the things that we normally talk about. Um, Casper Rigsby is uh, one of the folks behind uh, Atheist Republic and is a former member of the Aryan Nation. Do I have that right? Uh, that is correct. All right. Well, welcome back to the show, first of all. Thanks for coming. Oh, uh, yeah. Of course. Always glad to do uh, any of these, especially talking about this subject. <laughs> so tell me your story. Were you were you born into this? Were you brought up into this? Was it something you came to later? Um, no, I, I actually grew up in a uh, fundamentalist Christian home. And there, there was always, always a level of, of subtle racism. Um, I live in Tennessee. I grew up in Tennessee. So so there's always been a, a level of subtle racism around us. But when I was 15, we moved down to Georgia. And after that move, I, uh, I was having a lot of trouble fitting in with the people at school and just fitting in in general. And I, uh, I met some guys at high school that – were involved in the Aryan Nation um, through their families and such. And uh, they kind of, you know, took me under their wing. It, it's a lot like a, a lot of a lot of um, young inner city youths get involved in gangs um, where they're, they're looking for a family. They're looking for um, acceptance. And uh, there's there's people there that accept them. Um, so it's very easy to fall into. Was it overt that this was what they were doing? Because I, I understand a lot of times when um, organizations like this recruit people, they sort of present it as something uh, a little softer than it turns out to be. So like they kind of get the hooks in and then they, they kind of turn up the, the, the radicalism. Was that something that happened or was it just very open? Like, hey, we're the Aryan Nation. Check us out. Like, like how, did that, how did that dynamic work? I wasn't even introduced to the organization itself. Um, off the bat, it was more, um, hey, come hang out with us, come do these things with us. Um, I've always been really big into music, and as, as anyone that's that's been involved in the the neo Nazi and Aryan Nation and and radical white supremacist sex knows, like there's a, a big music scene involved there, a lot of heavy metal music and stuff. So it was a lot of, hey, man, uh, we're having this jam out here at this place, and you want to come hang out and listen to some music and shit. And, you know, of course there's, I mean, it's it's really just a gathering of like a hundred fucking Nazi kids. Um, and then like their their uncles and and parents and stuff are hanging out in the house and having their own separate meeting uh, that's way more involved. Um, as far as the level of um, radicalization goes, um, of course, that's that wasn't up front. Um, initially, it was it was a matter of, hey, you know, a, a constant reminder of, hey, these people are messing up our society. Look at these people fucking up everything for everybody. Wouldn't we all better be better off if we were separate? You know, if we had our own place and had, they had their own place and, and we'll just, you know, we'll do our thing. They can do theirs and they can fuck up their own place instead of fucking up all our shit. So when I first got involved, it was kind of billed as a, a separate separatist sort of movement um, and not the insidious uh, ideological uh, thing that it really is. Was was there a turning point where you realized like, wait a minute, like I went to this show and like, this is cool and music and everything, but like I'm hearing racial slurs and like all this kind of stuff. Like, was there a moment where you realized what was going on? And that, so, uh, I mean, that was a thing that appealed to you at the time or like talk me through that. Well, um, it, it was a thing that wasn't abnormal. That's the thing. A lot of people don't get, this isn't abnormal. Um, in the South, if you grow up in a in a predominantly um, white area, especially I, I grew up in trailer parks. 
Um, so, so racial slurs and stuff, this, that wasn't abnormal. Um, it wasn't abnormal to hear that shit all the time. These could have just been anybody. Um, when they, when they started uh, talking about like the Reich and Hitler and the SS and stuff, I was like, well, that's a little fucking weird because, you know, we, we learn in history class, like that's terrible shit. But then we start, you know, uh, they start talking about conspiracy theory shit about the Holocaust is fucking bullshit um, and stuff like that. And they, they, if you're not well educated on the matter, um, it's the same way with any sort of conspiracy theory. It's very easy to get drawn into that and, and, and to fall right into it and go, yeah, well, look at these dots and connect these dots and see how this all plays out. See, um, so it's it's very easy to fall into, especially if you're just looking for a place to be accepted. Um, and these people are like, hey, we want you here. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know if it's human nature or if it's the nature of our, of our culture, but I, I do think there is a tendency to not ask too many questions when somebody points and says, like, well, this group of people is the source of our problems. And if only they went away or they died or they were put in jail or something like that, that you know, all this would be so much better. Uh, and, and so, I mean, was that kind of the message? Was that was that what appealed to you at the time or part of it anyways? Well, that that was definitely the initial message. That was the message I got from from my friends at the time, and I, of course I put that in air quotes because these weren't really my friends. These were recruiters. Right. Um, these these were people that would turn on me on a fucking dime. Right now, um, if some of these people knew what I was doing and what I'm talking about, they'd be trying to hunt me down and hurt me um, because you're you're not supposed to leave. I mean, it's it's just like any other organization that's that's ideologically based like that. When or or a gang, you know, once you're in, you're in, and you don't fucking leave. Um, I left the state. I went to prison and left the state, which is is why um, I was able to really get out. Um, otherwise, I would I would have to protect my identity. I couldn't do this without really being fearful for my life. And so was it a slow burn? I mean, because, you know, if, if you're a full fledged member of the organization, I have to think that, you know, at some point you're I mean, you're into most of what they're saying, if not all of it. And so, you know, that, that's one thing that I think a lot of people may not get is that, you know, the people who are in these organizations, they're not necessarily born hating. Right. Like it, it it's a slow thing that builds. And eventually you you look back and you're like, whoa, like I came from this very innocent, you know, uneducated uh, you know, they're giving me an answer to my problems thing to like, holy crap, I'm part of something that is like actively causing harm to people. Can you talk about that process? Well, there's there's it, it's much like with religion. There's there's people that are born into it. Um, their families are in it and you get sort of indoctrinated with it all throughout your life. Um, these are people that end up generally being true believers. Um, the same is with religion, like fundamentalism. Um so, so there is the the main core of these organizations are is made up of true believers. These are people that honestly and truly believe in the cause wholeheartedly. You're not going to talk them out of it. This is their mission. It's what they're about. Then you have the people that get recruited in, like me, um, and those people can become true believers, um, just like with religion. But those people can also stay sort of on the fringe. They can always sort of have their doubts and, and have questions and, and be wondering what this is really all about. And that's sort of where I stayed because I wasn't brought in to be like a foot soldier, uh, so to speak, like someone out out just uh, causing shit in the neighborhood and beating up black folks and stuff like that. Um, most of us kids, what what we were doing – um, teenagers especially, was trying to get people elected into public office. So people within the organization, people that the organization um, – people that were sympathetic to the cause of the organization, these are the people that we tried to get into office and into positions of power. Um, so a lot of what I did was going around and trying to to sway voters. I, I went to people's houses. I'm like, hey, vote for this person. This guy's really awesome. And I was, you know, helping campaign for people and shit. Um, 
and and so it's a, it's a weird sort of thing because you 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 know we've all had somebody call our house or knock on our door and hey you should vote for this guy um, because he's awesome for this reason and that's most of what I did was to try to help these people with that. Yeah, I think that's another thing that a lot of people may not sort of actively realize is that these organizations are not just a bunch of you know thuggish people going around causing chaos and and beating people up right like these are as far as you know, organizationally like a lot of times these people are very well organized there there's uh, there's a strategy to what they do and uh and, and they're working on getting real political power it's it's not just about like chaos and beating people up well yeah for for the Aryan nation especially this is a long game um They've been working on on trying to get people in power for well over eighty years, um, and and they've been slowly succeeding. There there are people all throughout your local and state governments, damn near in any state you live, that are involved in either this organization or another white supremacist organization, or they are sympathetic to the movement. Um, and and it's it's pretty insidious, really. Because these are these are the the people that they want are especially sheriffs. Um, sheriffs are a perfect target for this group um, and groups like them. Because when you control the police force through the sheriff, uh, you have a lot of fucking leeway. You get away with a lot of shit. They they want local government, uh, mayors, governors, people like that. State representatives, if they can get that high, which they they managed to do, especially in this last election, it was never even thought by me that that it would be some like, hey, we're going to have a white supremacist as as the fucking president. And that isn't to say that Donald Trump actually is a white supremacist. I don't think that man's quite smart enough to be involved in the organization. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I think just, in the cultural sense, he's a white supremacist, but I doubt I, he's not like an like an Aryan nation white supremacist kind of person. He's a man that doesn't have any ideological beliefs, really. Um, he, he's about him. So, yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> but but he he can definitely be a patsy and and what he's managed to do is to bring others in who do have some some very ideological holdings um and, and a lot of people within his cabinet and within his inner circle are definitely ideologues um that have some very strong white supremacist ideological beliefs uh bannon for one sessions is sort of a uh, more of a, a sympathizer but he he's shown some very sympathetic tendencies to the the white supremacist movement so you know it's it's weird to see see it at that level now um and to see it so openly that, that's the crazy thing because everything that we were doing at the time, it was backdoor sort of shit. Like you never really met the candidates. They're not showing up to rallies and shit. You just – you know that those people are on your side, and, and so you're trying to help them get where they need to be so they can help you. So it's it's weird to see it so out in the open and just so normalized now. I'm like, oh my god, you be, like people just don't understand what's happening right in front of their faces, and it's it it drives me crazy. Really, it's just it, it's insane that people don't understand the sort of threat that we're under. The more that this is normalized, that that's the worst part of it. Normalizing white supremacy is absolutely abhorrent. And that, that's why I'm so upset with uh, especially people within the atheist movement who honestly either unwittingly normalize this shit like Sam Harris did by talking to Charles Murray or, or people that knowingly are trying to normalize this shit. Um, it's just – it's I, I don't know. It's, it's, it baffles me because there's no logical, rational reasoning behind it. Yeah. Um, you so know. talk to me for a second about you, you touched on it a little bit ago. You said, you know, most of your most of your function was to go around and uh, promote candidates. I mean, was that was that the day to day? I mean, was it was this something like, you know, after school, let's go get together with the Aryan Nation folks and like meetings and that kind of stuff. Like, What is I, I'm trying to imagine what social life is like 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 what's your day-to-day -day look like when you're a member of this organization like i mean do you just see it as like another club that you're part of or is it like an integral part of your life or how does that work for for me because i i i got deep into it but not so deep that it was overwhelming um 
it, it was kind of like a club or something, but a, a lot of it, like I said, was going to like little rallies and stuff and going to little um, makeshift concerts um, out in somebody's fucking cabin somewhere, you know, um, because you, when you're daring – during an election season or moving up towards one, that's when you're, you know, kind of on the front lines, you know, robocalling and doing stuff like that. But then, um, you know, the rest of the time, you're pretty much just hanging out, you know, doing normal shit. These, these are your friends. So you're hanging out with your friends, you're drinking and, and you know, just doing normal shit. It's it's day to day life. Um only with a, a very fucked up tent to it, especially living in Georgia. I mean, I lived right outside of Atlanta. So I went to a high school that was at, at least half African American, if not more. Um, so it's like, you know, I go to high school and like a day to day just kind of sneering at people and stuff and like, you piece of shit. I, I fucking, I can't wait till you're goddamn out of here and like we can get our shit back together. Um, so it was it was honestly it's just it's day to day life, but then you know you've got this sort of weird fucked up thought process in the undertow that that's always there, just like nagging at you a little bit, yeah, and I think that points out something really important that I feel gets missed in the conversation surrounding these issues is that you know the people who are doing this stuff they are not some fringe like other group that's operating in shadows somewhere you know 50 miles outside of town right like these are the people who are in our schools and people we grocery shop with and like our soccer coaches and people on the pta like um because i think it's you know we have this tendency to think like like okay that is so abhorrent there is nothing resembling that in me. I am not a hateful person. I understand that racism is a thing. I want racial justice. I understand my privilege, that kind of stuff. We, we get so wrapped up in that, that we basically wrap all of these people in a tent and push them off to the side as if they're the other. They're not amongst us. They're not us. Right. And I think that's a really important thing to realize. Like, no, these people are us. Uh, it, it, it's moms and dads and PTA members and teachers and police and politicians. Can you sort of talk about that? Um, yeah, it's it, it really is. It really is your your everyday average folks. I mean, it's it's really the people that you run into every day, especially if you live somewhere like I do, like here in the south. Um, you, you run into these people all the time. I, I live about 45 miles or so away from birthplace of the KKK. Um, the KKK was actually established in Pulaski, Tennessee. So, I mean, it's, it's right down the street. I drive there in about an hour. Um, so it, it's, it's weird because I go to Walmart. Um, I see neo-Nazis and skinheads at Walmart every day. And I see them – because I know what I'm looking for. A lot of people don't see them. They they walk right by them, and it's just like, oh, well, you know, that's just a person. What is it about them that sticks out to you that people don't notice? Oh, uh, there's there's so much, so many, so many different things. Um, uh, clothing, for one. Um, there, there's a lot of little little signs that you'll see. Um, skinheads have have gone from like straight bald heads. Um, you know, they, they've gone to, uh, sort of the Richard Spencer style haircut, um, which I actually still keep just because it looks good on me. Um, <laughs> you know, so the, the almost Nazi looking haircut, but I mean, there's, there's little things and looks more than anything looks that they give to other people. Um, you'll see them in line, like at Walmart and stuff, and you'll see them cut their eyes over to somebody and it's, you can see hatred boiling under their skin just pouring out of their eyes and and i i know true believers when i see them but it's different than someone that's just like oh i don't really like being around these people it's more of a if if i had the ability i would fucking kill you right here on the fucking spot <laughs> and, and there's there's really people that feel like that and when you know what you're looking at you see it written right on their fucking face it's like a billboard some some people uh are are in the the same position as me i actually have white supremacist tattoos on one of my arms like the whole fucking arm is sleeved out with white supremacist paraphernalia 
nobody notices that except for police officers who have been trained to look for it and other white supremacists. So I get approached by these people quite often. It's like, hey, buddy, what's up? And I'm like, yeah, I'm not with you anymore. <laughs> you know, I just thought I have how to does shut that it conversation go? Oh, no, I, I've, I've been approached with just like, you know, wanting to strike up a conversation and I, I have to shut it down. It's an immediate no, we're, we're not discussing this. Um, I'm, I'm not involved anymore. I, I'm not with that anymore. So you can keep that to yourself. Um, I have not had to get into any fist fights or, or verbal or, or physical altercations, but I've gotten into some verbal altercations um, on occasion. So it's it's pretty weird. It's it's far more weird when police officers pull me over or something and they notice them because it's immediate because mm -hmm. my my tattoos I got during prison. Um, so it's automatically they look at them and they say, oh, that's prison ink. And then they look deeper and they go, oh, wait, you have SS bolts all over your fucking arm. Uh, are you involved in the Aryan Brotherhood? And I'm like, no, I was part of the Aryan Nation. I was never in the Aryan Brotherhood. But I did get these in prison. What What's the difference um, between the two? I actually thought they were the same thing. It's just ignorance on my part. No, the no, it's it's a common it's a common thought too. Um, the Aryan Brotherhood is actually just a prison gang uh, that oh, was started by okay. within prison. Um, so they're not actually affiliated with the Aryan Nation. Uh, the Aryan Nation itself is actually a Christian identity group, um, and they are a recognized domestic terrorist organization, recognized by the FBI as a domestic terrorist organization in this country. But the reason they are allowed to continue to exist and thrive in this country is the same reason the KKK is allowed to exist and thrive in this country, even though they are a recognized terrorist organization. And it's because of religious freedom. So – um, the, the Aryan nation's ideology is built on the, a Christian identity. One of the, one of the, the foundational groups within the Aryan nation is actually the church of Jesus Christ Christian. So if you ever hear somebody say that they're in that church, they are 98% positive to also be in the Aryan nation, um, because they're almost one in the same. So it's it's wrapped around a Christian identity, um, which is another thing that that was made it so easy to fall into because I'd already been raised in a fundamentalist Christian home um, with fundamentalist Christian ideals. So it was easy to take these Christian ideas that they put forward to, to validate the the racism and the bigotry and the prejudice, and and just let that escalate. What started you down the path toward leaving? <laughs> it's it's odd. It's it's much like much like why I left Christianity. Um, I g got too deep into it. Um, I studied too hard. I looked too deep. Um, as it, it's like when you, I, I guess metaphorically, when you look in the face of a demon, and, and you realize that you're actually looking in a mirror, and that demon's you. Um, when I when I started really digging into the the organization and what the end game was, I came to understand that the end game is world domination and utter genocide of all undesirables. That is the that's the ultimate goal. And undesirables uh, meaning anyone who's not white. Um. Oh God. Not just. Well, and, not and I'd white. imagine like gay people and <laughs> et cetera. Oh, right. Okay, so I'm I would be considered a race traitor um, because I've I've left the movement and because I uh, stand up for uh, LGBTQ rights and for um, equality of of the races and sexual equality um, because I stand up for those things I'm considered a race traitor. I am hated more than a Jew, a black person, or a gay person, or even a trans person. I'm the top of the list of people that need to be exterminated, according to these people, because I'm enabling them. I'm gotcha. fighting against our own people to give equality and um, a chance at a better life to ultimately what are other undesirables. Um, so, so I'm the worst of the worst, according to them. 
you know, then it's it's, you know, it's Jews, black people, homosexuals, trans people. You know, every, everybody that's not white, of course, is on right, the list. Right. But then there there are several white people. Um, you know, a, a lot of people within the atheist movement are people that would be exterminated immediately yeah. if they were able to. Was it coming to the realization that that's what it was about and that didn't sit well with you? Because um, you mentioned initially that to you it felt more like, you know, this is this is about separatism. And was it realizing that it wasn't actually about separatism and that the end game was, uh, you know, getting rid of all the end? I mean, it, it was that the realization that made you think like, wow, no, this isn't this isn't comfortable to me at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, you know, deep down within my core uh, at, at some level, um, I've always been a humanist and it's something I didn't understand or embrace earlier in my life, mostly because I didn't understand it. So it wasn't offered to me uh, to be embraced. You know, I, like lack I said, of knowledge I grew up and fun- lack of education kind of thing. Yeah, I, I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian home. So like humanism, secularism, atheism, these were not things that were ever discussed, that were ever talked to, that were ever offered as an option to what I'd always know. Um, but my, my path to leaving Christianity was much like my path to leaving white supremacy. It was a matter of, you know, digging deep into these things and going, I'm not OK with that. Like that just does not sit right with me. I can't. I can't possibly justify, you know, going to such lengths. Um, I can't justify those feelings. I can't justify um, taking part in those actions. Like what if what if they get to the point where it's time to actually take action? Can I actually go out on the front line? Am I, am I going to murder people over this? And, and I, I couldn't. That, that, no, that wasn't going to happen. I couldn't I couldn't accept that. So I actually left the organization. I ended up getting deep into drugs. I, I you know, basically had walked away from all my friends. Um, I, I actually walked away from my own family. My family moved back to Tennessee when I was uh, fixing to turn 17. I told them to go fuck themselves. And I was staying in Georgia and I was still in part of the organization at the time. And that was one of the reasons I had stayed um, was to continue what, the, the work I was doing there. And so I had nothing. I had nothing but these people. And then when I came to an understanding of what that was all about and, and you know, moved away from that, it, it was devastating emotionally because I, I, that was it. I had nothing. I was down to, you know, absolutely nothing. So I I turned to drugs and alcohol constantly. I got fucked up constantly. I started selling drugs and I ended up in prison. And and prison was the long road out of Christianity and out of racism altogether. Yeah, that um, was going to be my next question because I think you know, coming to the conclusion that like yes, I I am not down with the idea that people need to be exterminated. It's it's still a pretty long way to go from there to anti-racist activism. So yeah, t- talk to me about that process. Um. Well, yeah i uh, I spent um, nearly three years in a uh, closed security prison in Georgia. Um, and for people that aren't familiar with with the terminology of what you know the uh, different levels of prison are, there's uh, minimum security and then uh, medium security and then close security, which is like one step below maximum. Um, and unfortunately, the reason I had I had such small time, but I was in a close security prison, which is I, I was around lifers and people that had 30, 40 year sentences and people that had multiple life sentences. Um, I, I spent my time around murderers and uh, rapists and, and just hardcore motherfuckers, you know, that it like real fucking criminals. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't one of those at all. You know, I was just a guy that, uh, had a fucking drug problem and it was easier to, uh, pay for my dope by selling dope. So I could get what I needed by selling it. Um, it's much easier than having a real job. So because I have a heart condition, um, they had to put me in this 
particular prison because it had the best medical facilities of any of the other prisons. So, you know, just by virtue of, of having a medical condition, I ended up with three years sitting around guys that were lifers. You know, that's where they fucking lived for the rest of their lives. And and of course, I'm in Georgia, so it was predominantly black folks. I would say it was almost three quarters of the inmate population there was black folks. Um, and I, some of my best friends, the, 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 some of the, the coolest people I met while I'm in prison. And that's weird to say, hey, I'm surrounded by criminals. People have done horrible fucking shit, um, to, to be where there are. Um, you have to realize a lot of those people, when they get that sort of time, that's where they live now. That's their home. So their attitude changes a lot. And basically the, the idea is you come in there, you calm the fuck down, you you know, don't do anything fucked up and be cool because if you fuck up their home, if you fuck up their home environment, then they're gonna fucking hurt you. So basically it's it's the the mindset of okay, well the you these people live here, you're in their home chill the fuck out and most of them are were really laid back you know just like this is my life i'm just trying to fucking play some poker work out and watch some fucking tv <laughs> because that's all i can do every fucking day so that's what we did every fucking day and you get to know these people and you talk to them and you talk to them about their lives and stuff because you can't avoid them right that, that's a, when you're in a prison situation you can't avoid those people um even if you click up you know, with with a, a specific racial group or a specific uh, clique or a specific crowd, you can't avoid them. They're there constantly. You're going to eat lunch and breakfast and lunch with them every day. You eat dinner with them. You're going to be walking in the yard with them. You're going to be around these people constantly. Um, and it's a pretty fucked up existence if you don't, you know, just let some shit go and try to find a way to, to pass your time and get by it. And so I, I took three years of my life to do pretty much nothing but educate myself and study. I, I read nearly every book in our library um, at the prison. I, I spoke with people from all walks of life, from everywhere, um, multiple ethnicities. We had at least three trans people come through the prison system while I was there. Um, it was a nightmare for them. Um I, it was I, I can't even imagine, uh, you know, just I, I know some of what they went through, but just how it felt for them to be in that situation, um, because they were that was a definite target on their back. Mm -hmm. um, you, you see a trans person come through the prison system. They have breasts. That's automatic. That's a target yeah. right fucking there. Um, so it's, it's uh, so many things, so many things to experience in, in such a short amount of time. And, you know, for me, it, like going through it, three years was a fucking eternity. Um, but out here in the real world, three years is nothing. We pass fucking three years by in no time. Um, you know, my, my son's four and I, I'm just like, where did the time go? You know, it's been four years and, and right. I, I don't know where that time went, but sitting in prison, man, every day is a fucking eternity. So, you know, it, it drags in there and you don't have time to do anything else except, you know, either be bitter or figure it the fuck out. Figure out what the fuck got you there and see if you can change something. See if you can be better. I didn't want to go back. You know, um, I, I've never been like, hey, <laughs> prison was all right. That was fine. <laughs> right. And, uh, I've never had that thought in my mind. Like I don't want to ever go back there, ever, ever, ever. Um, so I got to do something different. Before I actually went into prison, when I was in the county jail waiting to go, I had a an old dude in there, and you know we talked all the time. And he he looked at me one day, said, "Man, you know, if you want more of what you've been getting, keep doing what you've been doing. If you want something different, you're gonna have to try something different." Um, and that stuck with me, you know, because I didn't want more of what I've been getting. And what I've been getting all my life up until that point was shit. And I didn't want more shit. Shit was terrible. 
I wanted something different. So I, I you know, like I said, I, I took my time to educate myself. And that's that's where I moved away from Christianity, too. I, I um, did not become atheist in prison, but I moved away from Christianity. And I was like this, you know, I don't I'm, I'm not jiving with this anymore. And, you know, I studied Islam and I was like, well, that's even worse. So uh, moved into Hinduism and I was like, this is too much shit to keep up with. And then I moved into <laughs> right. Buddhism. Um, I, I moved into Buddhism and I was like, well, this is pretty cool. Um, I like a lot of the ideas here, so I'll hang with this. And then it was like, well, you know, the whole God thing is just kind of bothering me. So I went with the agnostic thing for a while. And then I met my wife before we got married and stuff. And, you know, we went through church phases and I took her to Catholic mass and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, just trying to understand more of these ideas and she was along for the ride and then she just kind of looked at me one day and said you know i think you're a fucking atheist because i don't <laughs> think you believe in any of this bullshit and i was like hmm you know what i think you're right i mean I, I, yeah i think you hit the nail on the head i don't think i believe in any of this bullshit it all sounds like horseshit so it was it was just one of those aha moments and i think she knew long before me about herself and about me so you know i, I have lots of love for my wife and and We've we've been on a journey together, and uh, she's made me a much better person. A lot of what I do is because she has believed in me that I could be a better person and be something more than I uh, more than I grew up as, and, and more than I've been in the past. Talk to me about regrets. Um, I know I, I personally try to be a person who's like, you know, what happened in the past is what happened. And um, I can maybe try and figure out some positive stuff from it. But like dwelling on it doesn't accomplish anything. But like, I've also never been to prison. And I've also never been actively involved in a racist organization. <laughs> so like, maybe that's a privileged position for me to take is. So is is that past something that you dwell on? Um, I try not to. I actually, you know, when I, I, I battle with depression just as a, a, a personal disorder, I have clinical depression, so I battle with that a lot. So it's hard for me not to dwell on things. But a lot of times when I'm at my lowest, I look back on, you know, the, the times of just partying with my friends and getting fucked up and all that shit. And I'm just like, man, that was so much easier. Like I have to actually face shit every day now. Like I have to face all the bullshit every day now. And like I, I look back on a lot of that stuff and I'm like, man, it's so much easier. It was so much easier just to get fucked up and ignore it. But I, I have – I've come to terms with most of it. But I, I have one moment, and I guess it's a, it's an extended moment. It's a moment that took place over the course of about a year when I was in high school. Um, that I don't think I'll ever get over. It's my my one major regret. And uh, it's honestly a hard thing to talk to with with you, um, and especially on, on this podcast. But um, when I was in high school, I actually was involved with uh, several other people, and we, we bullied um, a young homosexual kid in the school for over a year straight and he ended up killing himself his junior year and that that's the one that that's the thing that eats me um and not even so much that that i was a part of that and that i contributed to that um the fact that i don't remember his name um because he didn't matter as a person to me at that time, um, he he was such an inconsequential individual, not even a human being in my eyes. Um, and to have somebody do that and to be able to look back on it and go, I just wish I could remember his name so I could, you know, at least in my own mind, say I'm so I can't even apologize in my own mind. I, cause I don't know who I'm supposed to apologize to. That's how inconsequential and meaningless they were to me. Um, and that's, 
that's the one thing I can't get over. Um, I, I've done plenty of horrible shit, but there's always been a way for me to try to atone for it and make up for it. And uh, I can't fix that one. I, I can't take it back. I can't apologize. I can't make it right. Um, and no amount of, of work that I do ever will atone for it. Um, that's a, a very hard thing to accept that you can do something that is so horrible that you can't ever make it right. There's nothing you can do. Um, so, I'm sorry. No, sorry. You're, you're fine. Um, shit just got really real. And that's, that's what we do on this show. That's, that's why, that's why this show exists. I guess what I'm searching for are lessons, right? Um, because at the end of the day, um, you, know, you and me, and uh, I imagine, you know, in, in anyone who listens to the show, what we're interested in is is how we can make it better, how we can fix it, how we can stop people from being hurt, how we can how we can fix these situations, how we can stop people from hurting each other, and I think you are probably a person who is in a, in a unique position to have perspective on that issue. And I think, um, you know, the entire, our entire conversation up till now, I think is, uh, at least in part to illustrate that point, you know, you, you've been in the trenches, right? You've been inside of this whole thing. You've been a part of this, you know how it works. So the question is coming from a person with, the the unique insight and the unique knowledge that you have how how do we fight this um first and foremost the most important thing that we have to do is to not allow this to be normalized um especially in the way that it's being normalized right now um we have to stop pretending that you're going to defeat an ideology like white supremacy with just better ideas and more words. You're not. It's the same as religion. It is an ideological belief. There are true believers. There are fanatics. You are not going to talk them out of what they believe. It would be like trying to sit down with a deeply entrenched member of ISIS or the Taliban and have a discussion with them and think that you're going to walk away and everything's going to be better because it's not. We cannot continue to allow others to normalize this and go, oh, it's just a difference of opinion. You know, This is just a different political p- position or whatnot, um, like what Richard Spencer has been trying to do with his alt-right movement. He's trying to rebrand the fucking Nazi ideology and call it something else. And it's no different than putting a fucking dog in a tutu and calling it a fucking ballerina. That's still not a fucking ballerina. It's still a dog in a tutu. And Richard Spencer can call his group the fucking alt-right. He can call it fucking Santa Claus's Christmas fucking angels for all I give a shit. It's still the Nazi ideology rebranded and put out here to be normalized and to say, oh, well, this is just a difference of opinion. But it isn't. So the the first step in fighting is to make sure that we make our voices very loud and very clear and say um, intolerance of intolerance is not bigotry. It's not bigoted to be intolerant of white supremacy. This is a dangerous ideological belief, and it is horribly fucking dangerous, and there's proof Every day in the news, every week, you're going to see more and more proof because it keeps getting normalized. People, people are getting hurt because of this. Um, the, the latest attack in Portland is an illustration of the escalation of this normalization because a man actually believed he could get on a train in Portland – 
and harassed two Muslim women and, and possibly would have attacked those two women if it were not for three men that stood up against him um, and, and stopped him from harassing them um, and, and potentially stopped him from harming them. And two of those men lost their lives because they stood up. And what pisses me off about this is that was a train full of fucking people, full of fucking people. There were only six people involved in the incident. You're telling me that there weren't another fucking 10, 12 people in that fucking train car? Where was everybody else? Are they calling the, are you calling the cops? You're on a fucking train. Everybody on that fucking train should have stood up against him. Every last fucking one of them. But there are people so entrenched in fear, so scared of doing something that they won't stand up. And that that pisses me off because all it takes is for people to be apathetic. All it takes is for people to look the other way and say, oh, that's some fuck shit. That's not my problem. I'm going to look over here for terrible shit happened to other people. And we have to stop doing that. Um, those of us that actually give a shit, we have to stop doing that. We have to stop being apathetic and turning a blind eye and saying, that's not my problem. Because it's all of our problems. Anybody that actually has a, a sense of efficacy um, and, and, a, and a sense of humanism and humanity, it's your fucking problem. If you're on that fucking train with this guy, it shouldn't be three people standing up against him. It should be a whole fucking train car telling him to sit the fuck down or we're going to beat you down and you will stay down until the fucking cops pull you out of this goddamn train car. And it should be every fucking day. These, these people, when I was involved in the organization, you didn't come out and go, how fucking Hitler in the fucking streets. You didn't run around <laughs> waving goddamn Nazi flags. You didn't fucking do that because you would got the shit kicked out of you by large groups of fucking people. But we've gotten to a point where it's just like, oh, well, we can't be violent. You know, we, we, we've just got to talk about these things because, you know, we can, we can fix everything with words. Well, fuck, you can't. You can't fix everything with words. When people are marching through the streets with fucking Nazi flags and flying the fucking Nazi salute, it's time to say no. Put down. Just no. And that's the thing that, that kills me because a lot of times, even if you show up just to say I oppose you, like people aren't okay people aren't okay with that. Like I mean we don't even have to rise to the level of violence or civil unrest. I mean, if we show up in large numbers just to be a presence and to drown them out, like even that is somehow unacceptable. Like we have to we have to answer this hateful and destructive ideology with polite conversation. Like are you fucking kidding me? Like I, I would love for someone to point to any point in history where that's actually been a thing, right? Like people point to, uh, you know, the, the civil rights movement in the sixties and it's like, okay, sure. Maybe they didn't have, you know, bats and bricks beating the shit out of people, but there was most certainly civil unrest, you know, and people were Some saying that, that, that's the thing. Some groups did have bats and brick, bats and bricks beating the shit out of people. They had to, to protect yeah. their own fucking neighborhoods. Well, and, um, and, and, and I think that's the point that so many people miss because people who are sitting in privileged positions who don't actually have a personal stake in this, uh, you know, even if you know, for the most part, their heart's in the right place, what they, they have the luxury of seeing this as an ideological divide, right? They see you know, someone like Richard Spencer speaking at a college and protesters showing up. What they, they, they see that as simply an academic battle of ideas with no actual consequences in the real world. And that people aren't actually getting harmed by this. And the people who are showing up to protest or to shut the place down, they're not there to change Richard Spencer's mind. 
they're not there to meet better ideas or to meet bad ideas with better ideas. They're there to stop him from fucking hurting people. Like that's the, the conversation that we, we've talked about this concept on the show a couple of times. And it's so frustrating to see people frame this as, uh, you know, as the opposition It's automatically our position to work on changing this person's mind. We have to ignore the actual harm that they're doing to people, whether by inciting violence or simply further marginalizing them, you know, advocating political positions that further marginalize them. Um, you know, we have to meet that actual harm with polite conversation. And when that continues to not work for decades upon fucking decades, that more polite conversation is the answer. And I'm not here for it. People are fucking dying. People's quality of life is being taken away. These are not academic ideas. And uh, I just, I, I think about all of the opportunities, like you said, where people had the chance to stand up. Even people who ideologically think what this guy was saying and doing is reprehensible but didn't think that enough to stand up or, you know, even not, you know, getting up and getting in front of the guy and and putting your body on the line, but even just speaking up and saying, no, this isn't okay. How many otherwise good people do that every day? If, you know, we want to talk about regrets, um, you know, I've got one from high school and it's nowhere near on the level of yours. But there was a trans girl that I went to high school with. I had no idea what the concept of being trans was at the time, although I was aware that I, I, I knew who I was. I just didn't have the vocabulary for it. And I was jealous of her because she was expressing who she was. She had asked people to start calling her by a new name. She wore her hair long. She wore, she wore very feminine clothing and people gossiped about her people t- people bullied her mercilessly and it happened in front of me knowing who i was and i was terrified to speak out because of course then it turns on me what are you one too and of course i knew on the inside i was too so i couldn't speak up i didn't speak up and i can but only imagine a part just scream yes yes i yeah. fucking am and you need to stop yeah, that that's the the thing that kills me because I know that there's so many good people out there that have that voice in the back of their head screaming, screaming, say something, say something, to stop this, stop this isn't right, stop it, and they don't. They they quiet that down. They push it down inside of them, and they keep it down, and other people hurt because of it. Whether it's emotionally, whether it's physically, other people get hurt by inaction and it's it's terrible it's a horrible thing to think that we could be so apathetic or so fearful and afraid that we won't act it's just it's a horrible thing yeah and i just you know i can only imagine i i I don't know how many friends she had and i know she had a few but i mean having a few friends when the entire school thinks you're a freak like i don't know you know, I, I don't know that that makes a difference. You know, I, I don't know where she is today. I don't I don't know if she's OK. I don't know, you know, um, and that, you know, that eats at me. I guess I could probably try and look her up on Facebook. But I mean, what would I say? You know, hey, remember me? The person who an, another person who watched all of this stuff that happened to you? Yeah, I turned out to be trans, too. Sorry about that. Like, what what, what am I going to say? You know what I mean? Like that. that that's a chance that I had to make a difference for somebody and it was missed and uh, a a chance that I had uniquely to make a difference for somebody knowing who I was at the time. And I didn't. And uh, you know, who knows how things could have turned out. And that's, you know, that's where I say like, you know, in, in, in some ways regret is, is useless, right? Because you can't go back and change it, but that doesn't stop you from wondering. That doesn't stop you from wishing like, God, what the fuck was wrong with me? Why didn't I say something? Uh, because I, because I knew better, you know, I, I wasn't even throwing my hat in with the bullies. I fucking knew better and I never joined in, but I most certainly stood by and let it happen without saying anything, without trying to stop it. And 
you know, how many times throughout my high school career did I do that? I mean, I certainly participated in bullying of one variety or another, but, um, you know, it, it was, it, you know, how many times did I contribute to that? And where are those people now? And all we can really do, you or I, person listening to the show, um, all we really have is being better and knowing better. And saying, you know what, the next time I see this happening, I am going to stand up and say something. I'm not going to let this go unchallenged. Um, You know, I I used to be one of those people that, you know, when the Westboro Baptist Church would show up somewhere, I would be the one saying like, well, if you show up to counter protests, you're just, you're giving them the attention they want because that's all they want is they want attention. And if you ignore them, they'll go away. And I I know how wrong that was. and And it took reading an essay on the internet. I don't even remember where it was. I've spent hours trying to find it again and I haven't been able to. And it was from a guy who every time the Westboro Baptist Church shows up in his town, he puts on one of those silly looking fucking horse head masks from Halloween and runs around dancing, just making a mockery of them. And he explained why he does this. He said, imagine being a queer kid, being a trans kid, being a a kid who's non-white in a car driving past these people saying all of these awful and hateful things and seeing that there was no one there to say, no, this isn't us. This isn't what we stand for. What message does that send to you as a kid? You see all of this awful stuff happening and you see no one opposing it. What does that say to you? And that was a big turning point for me. That was, uh, you know, one of those, you know, whenever someone posts those, you know, what's a big thing you've changed your mind on to like, you know, prove that you're intellectually honest enough to change your mind. Uh, that's a big one for me. And that's why, you know, when and where I'm able, I will always show up and when and where I'm able, I will always speak up. And that doesn't mean, you know, be reckless and, you know, somebody has got a gun out, put yourself in front of the gunman. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, you know, that, that that's not what we're saying here. We're not saying necessarily put yourself in danger, put your life on the line. But you know, you don't have to do that to be visible as the opposition, right? Um, you know, it can be as simple as not laughing when someone tells the racist joke at work or, um, you know, saying, Hey, that's, that's not cool. When someone's talking about the trans person who just came out at work, uh, we all, we all need to be those people. So, uh, because we never know what it's going to mean to the other person in question. Um, and I, I don't want to live with any more of the knowledge that someone was hurt and I didn't do what I could do to help them. Um, wow. (laughs) This is not where I expected this episode to go, but I'm glad it went there. And I, 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 that's that's really the the most important thing honestly like we we have to do something um i you know dan and i dan errol and i um we we've talked on on his show recently um and we've talked before in the past um because dan dan is straight up said hey man you see a fucking nazi punch him in the fucking face and uh you know he's gotten a lot of flack for that and then I, I get a lot of flack because I support Dan in his position to say that. And yet people were like, oh, well, you advocate for punching fucking Nazis in the face. Well, no, I don't. I don't advocate for that at all. There's a reason I don't advocate for violence from other people. And it's because I'm not going to do the very thing that I'm against, which is inciting violence from others. But here's the thing. I will punch the shit out of a fucking Nazi. Me, <laughs> personally. I'm not going to tell anybody else to do that. No, I'm not going to tell anybody to be violent. Me, I'm fucking violent. I will get violent as shit. That's why I don't go to a lot of protests and stuff like that. Because I, the first time somebody does something stupid, yeah, I'm going to get violent. I'm going to get violent as shit. That's me. That's what's in my heart. And I'm not going to deny that. But I don't advocate for it. I don't advocate for other people to do what I feel like I should do because not all of us are made to do everything 
You know, not everybody is made to punch people in the face. Not everybody has that in them. But everybody has it in them to do something. Like you said, even if it's just speaking up, even if it's just being the person that doesn't laugh at the joke, like you said, do something. Don't sit back. And when you see somebody do something and go to a level that you wouldn't go, don't automatically belittle them. Don't automatically go, oh, well, look at you just stooping to their level. Um, I'm sorry, honey, but we're all at their level now. They've drug us all down here. This is where we live. That's the level we live at right now. And everybody not doing something before we got here is why we got here. Because people stopped doing stuff. People stopped speaking. People stopped caring. More to the point, people started normalizing it and going, well, hey, let's just have a conversation. Let's just talk about it. We, we got Lacey Green right now fucking trying to have conversations with fucking um, anti-feminists and MRAs and shit that have sent her violent fucking messages about how they fucking want to rape and kill her. She's, She's dating like, well, one. Yeah. For fuck's sake. Well, we, should, <laughs> we should talk to them. Let's debate them. Let's have a conversation. Um, you're going to get yourself killed, honey. <laughs> like no offense i don't i don't think you're like not intelligent or something but i think you're not thinking this through <laughs> like, i i, 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 I think she's fo- i think she's following the money is what she's doing um, oh yeah more she's, than she's she's she's, she's, uh, she's privileged <laughs> and she's following the money and she sees she sees what gets the hits on youtube and she sees dave rubin's patreon account and uh so i i have i have zero doubts that that's what's happening um, that, that, that's the only explanation that makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> other can of worms. Well, Casper, well, I, uh, you, uh conversation I have with somebody else. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's another hour long show. <laughs> well, Casper, I, uh, I appreciate your time and, uh, and, and I appreciate you being willing to go, uh, to go as deep as you did. Uh, and, and get as personal as you did, because I think I think those are the stories that really uh, th- that stick with people and that really make a difference from people. And those are the kind of stories that I always hear from people that are impactful to them. Um, so I, I appreciate you being uh, being open enough to to tell that story and uh, and and just for your time and, and for your story in general. Thanks for being here. Uh, my my time is always available and. Uh... You know, one thing I, I embraced with becoming an atheist is honesty. And uh, it's honesty to the point of brutality. Um, you, you've got to be honest with yourself first. And then you need to be honest with everybody else. And then that means, you know, owning owning your mistakes and being completely honest about them. Not that it helps to talk. It doesn't. It, helps, it won't help right. anything. But it helps other people. Right. You know, like you said, somebody's liable to hear that. And, and maybe they'll... Maybe they'll think about it. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gaytheist Manifesto. Definitely want to say thanks again to Casper for his time, for being so vulnerable and, and open and insightful. I definitely learned a lot. You can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash Manifesto. You can email us at Manifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at GaytheistCali. You can find the show on Twitter at Gaytheist. And a moment of silence for the absence of Ari's outro. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash the Gaytheist Manifesto and make a per episode donation to help us out. And if that's not doable, you can't always head over to iTunes and give us a five star review that helps us get heard by more people. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, if you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is the Gaytheist Manifesto.